Real life Martha from Baby Reindeer is now suing Netflix for $170 million over what she calls the biggest lie in television history. So excited that we've got Black Belt Barrister here to answer the question, could she win? Welcome to Popcorn Planet. I am Andy Signor. So grateful for Daniel coming back. We actually taped one, but so much has happened since then, Daniel, that I got to throw it away and restart. So welcome back, sir. Thanks for making the time. Uh, this story has just gotten crazier and crazier. And uh, I know you haven't seen the show, which is great because it's actually kept you a little bit more impartial on it all. But now you have looked at this new complaint that we've gotten in. Uh, we're looking at mm. the lawsuits. There's a lot of stuff coming in. I guess I want to start with Look, it, it she she makes a big point of this. This is a true story. It says it at the start of episode one, right? It only says it at the start of episode one. It doesn't say it in episode two, three, four, five, six. It has a disclaimer at the end that verifies, you know, some things can change. Uh, I want to start there. Does that is that a problem for Netflix that it said it once in the beginning and set the tone that this is a true story and now she's going to allege that elements of the story aren't? Is that enough of a case? I think that's a big problem for Netflix, even though it's not said at the beginning of every episode. Um, and even though there's a bit of a disclaimer at the end to say, well, we've changed certain characters, etc. cetera. I, I don't think the disclaimer at the end is enough. I don't think that it's enough that it only said it once, etc. cetera. I think that is a big problem for Netflix because it's a definitive statement. This is a true story. It's not a caveated statement, as you, you would usually expect. I mean, most casual viewers think nothing of it uh, unless they sit down and think about it. But had it said, based on a true story, then of course they could exaggerate it, which it leaves me with the question, why? Why say this is a true story is against based on a true story? And it seems to me, having not watched it, which is a, I think is a good position to be in, I can read the, the documents here, I think it's a good position to be in to, to compare that and think, well, they are obviously basing it on what they've been told about this story. And they've been clearly, it, it seems to me, they've been told that it is a true story. I think that's a problem. Right. And I want to play this clip next because this is the in Parliament, the select committee where Benjamin King of Netflix confirms it. I mean, Baby Ranger is an extraordinary story. And it is obviously a true story of the horrific um abuse that um, the writer and protagonist Richard Gadd suffered um, at the hands of a convicted stalker. Now he goes on and on, but right that right there, horrific abuse of a convicted stalker. It's a true story. He's not based on events, but I mean, he does at some point sort of try to, to do this. Let's play Take this one quick click because he tries to sort of defend well. Yeah, but we wanted to also defend Richard Gadd's pursuit for the truth. Reasonable precaution in um, disguising the real life identities of the of, of, of the people um, you know involved in that um, in that story. He's been identified, whilst hasn't he? also striking a balance with the veracity and authenticity of Richard's story, because we didn't want to anonymize that or make it generic to the point where it was no longer his story. Fundamentally, so that's where I want to ask you next. Like, so hmm. is that? Can can you do that? Is a true story, but oh, we also were you know dramatizing. Like, mm. is that is this comment going to haunt them? Well, again, I think this is a problem because uh, if you take that phrase that he said in isolation, he wants to strike a balance between the truth and the veracity of his story, and emphasis on his story. I suppose if it were written out, uh, I again in isolation, that's probably fine, but against the original comment that this is a true story of a convicted stalker, that the two, it, it's it's not enough. It, it's not enough to exculpate their liability. It still says that it is true. And I get the hint there that they are almost trying to pass blame to Gad to say, well, it's his story. We're just telling his story. And it's, he, it's him that says it's a true story. But again, at the same time, Netflix have this duty of care. So I suspect the argument they're going to run is that they are telling his story. He says it's a true story. We did what we could to determine that it's true based on what he said, etc. We did what we could regarding duty of care to anonymize, etc. It wasn't enough because it appears she's um, been identified. She's come forward, said, well, this was me and I'm suing you for it. 
So it is a problem. I, I think it is a real problem. Uh, so the other issue, and I want to get to what the real claims are, but before we even get there, this came out previously. Uh, apparently, Richard Gadd, who based the show on his own experiences, told the makers, Clerkenwell Films, that his stalker was never convicted. Sources indicate that Gadd told them that the stalker was the subject of an inclusion order, a civil order, and not the same as a criminal conviction of stalking. So this is a big point because in this lawsuit, she makes it very clear I'm not a convicted stalker. Uh, I'm not a criminal. Uh, she goes through and seemingly has a pretty good argument. If she wasn't convicted, she uses that. And it seems like Harvey has never been convicted of a crime. If this isn't true and they sort of over dramatize that, well, now she's also throwing in, well, there's an moment of essay in the, in the show that also I'm sure Richard can't prove. So whether it happened or not, she's able to now lump things in which is causes a big problem, right? Because now one of them isn't proven. The other ones can now all be in question, right? So I imagine if this is true and this was a semantics of exclusion orders or whatever it was, is that is that going to cause uh, harm here to Netflix's case? Uh, again, yeah, I think that's a problem. Uh, I think you're referring to page 17 um, where it references part of the show expressly saying that she, she was, was sentenced to sentenced nine months to in nine prison months in and a five-year restraining order. Yep. Five-year restraining order. So for the benefit of viewers. She never pled guilty to any crime. I, I, so not to yeah. her, but is it easy to get this kind of file, like this, to know was she actually in court? Out there in the UK, I've heard it's harder to get these. Sometimes these files get lost or they aren't actually, you know, kept in records. Can you clarify that as well? Yeah, it can be harder. Now, um, there's, there's a couple of ways of getting that. So, for example, an employer can uh, make a request for what we call a DBS check, which will return any uh, criminal convictions that are held on police computers, for example. Um, if something is in the magistrate's court, which is the lower level criminal court, it may be much more difficult to get hold of those. Um, but uh, here it says sentence to nine months in prison and a five year restraining order. Now, um, typically, I mean, the magistrate's court, just to confuse things further, the magistrate's court did have its powers extended to 12 months um, custody. Um, but has been reduced back to six months. Um, but ordinarily, this would be in the Crown Court and may or may not be reported. So if it's not reported, it'll be more difficult to find. That's not to say it doesn't exist. One can write to the court and make uh, inquiries to say, do you, know, do you have the documents for this particular person, this particular case? Because it is public justice. They are public documents. It is available. But they're not always written out in full form that, let's say, you know, the Prince Harry case that we see uh, is, is, is publicized in quite the same way. So it's more difficult to find, um, particularly if um, it is only the uh, restraining order or what we call an, a civil exclusion order, which can be made with or without a criminal conviction and with or without pleading guilty. And even if it's uh, what we would call a conditional or an absolute discharge, meaning that it's just done um, it, it's no longer a criminal conviction for the purposes of anything else. It's only for what came to court. And you can still have that exclusion order. Hmm. So even if someone were found not guilty, or even if the case were dismissed completely, you could still have this um, exclusion order or restraining order, broadly the same thing, typically one to five years. Five years would be at the top end. So that would indicate it's more serious, which would indicate that it was if, if that were the case, it would be a conviction. So uh, it, it's it's not uh, easy to find these, but uh, with the right uh, with the right vigor, contacting the right offices, the right people, you could find it. Well, in um, a lawsuit of this magnitude, I'm sure going to clear it up faster than it would for a typical person, right? I would think so. Absolutely. I mean, they will have a team of people. Um, if if I were on the Netflix team, I would um, be part of a team that would be contacting all of the court offices to say, you know, um, provide us these documents if they don't have them already. Because one so, thing that, yeah. Yeah. If it was, so if she does have an exclusion order, do you think that is still a basis for Netflix to have a case against say, well, look, it's close enough. We, we, we took some liberties, but you did have a legal repercussion. Or no, do I don't think it's, that's it's, enough because yeah, it's not uh, enough because you're calling her convicted stalker. Yeah, it's it's not the same thing. And so, for example, 
um, let's say someone were to go to court uh, against against you, for example, Andy, and say, you know, um, they're accusing you of doing something, contacting them or whatever, and they want an exclusion order. You could say to the court, look, I don't admit any of this, but uh, I'll agree to the order with, you know, without taking anything any further or, mm. you know, something like that. Or um, you could speak with prosecutors and say, look, if you just drop the case and go for the exclusion order, I won't fight the exclusion order and they can still make that against you. And the same is true here. So a court can make that order without a conviction and often does so. In fact, sometimes I've advised clients to agree to um, a, an equivalent of um, an exclusion order uh, in the family courts without any admission of liability. And so you don't need a conviction, you don't need a case decision or anything else. You can still have that, but it's not the same as a conviction. So again, referring back to what the show said, it quite clearly says that she was sentenced to prison, which means there was a conviction. And so now, that is very different, with or without the restraining order. Now, does this, the Lauren Ray came forward and spoke to Pierce. She was the other woman who was mentioned. She's like sort of another example that in the show, the character sort of alludes to, which also helps to pinpoint who Fiona was because Fiona had a, another, you know, incident of this. Uh, now, La Lauren also admits that she never charged uh, Fiona. There was never actually any charge there and admits that, yeah, Netflix has that wrong. Um, so that doesn't help the case either. However, she makes an argument, and that's one I've had of, but what really are the damages here for late being labeled convicted in the show when all the other stuff is remotely true? Is there an argument here that, okay, well, you weren't a convicted twice, you didn't serve jail time, but did, was that really what the show was trying to get across? And is that why you were harassed online? You still did all of this. Can that come into play and sort of attempt to knock down the charges and or amount of money, which is what, $170 million she's asking for? Are they going to be able to create a example of what this woman really did do to try to still make her pay for the bad acts she did do, even if she's able to semantically argue these things in court that she wasn't a convicted stalker? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. And these are uh, astronomical figures, and I, I can't comment on those for the United States, of course. Or what I can say is if it was in the United Kingdom, it would not be anywhere near that much. Um, but what I can also say is if if someone is accused of uh, a, a crime, of being convicted of a crime of that nature uh, and the surrounding nature in the story, so because if that bit is true, the rest is true, um, for the viewer that is uh, watching it because they are told that it's true, um, that obviously has an effect on that person. And so having not watched it, but know that it opens with that and know what the story overall is about, I would understand that this, this is making a definitive statement that this was someone who was harassing, stalking somebody, which are two broadly similar offences so that the base offence is harassment which is a course of conduct which is more than one occasion doing something that amounts to harassment and then when it comes to stalking it is harassment that amounts to stalking and so if i were to watch that and get the impression that someone is convicted of that offence that is quite damning and so to then say that the rest of it has just been exaggerated or something like that. I don't think is enough. It's interesting. The harassment versus stalking is a good note because it is there. You could still be harassing somebody, which she was doing, but not technically stalking, which sometimes is hard for, to prove. I've learned as we've been covering this case of people who've been stalked can't actually get those orders or the cops won't do anything because they haven't been threatened or what have you. Uh, so there is a version of this where I imagine Netflix will make that argument will uncover the 40,000 emails or whatever if, if this goes to trial. But at the end of the day, you stand firm. Kind of doesn't matter if she was labeled a convicted stalker and SA, et cetera, even no matter how big of a part it is in the show and the overall scheme of the picture of Martha, those specific accusations are enough that she could get some damages and win something. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just just caveating the rest of the story, etc., is not enough. I think she would still win substantial damages because for a viewer, it's it's clear to them that she's being convicted, having watched that show.
Yeah, it's it's just wild because you haven't watched the show, but in, as someone who has watched the show, this is like in a weird turn of events that almost feels like season two because in the show, if it is what he alleges, this is exactly what the character would try to do, manipulate the system, use what she can do, arguments, argue semantics, get away with it, and now it seems like it's going to happen on a legal scale. So it is a fascinating turn, but overall, final thoughts to you. Yeah, how much do you think this is going to be worth? 170 is astronomically ridiculous, it seems, but obviously she's going for the moon. Netflix has a lot of money, and this is now their biggest show ever, so it makes sense. The document is pretty cleverly put together. As I even read it, I was like, damn, they're making a good cause. I mean, could she make a lot on this, you think? I don't think it'll be anywhere near that amount. I mean, just uh, comparing it with the, um, you know, the Johnny Amber trial, et cetera, um, I think the numbers are going to be significantly smaller, even if she wins. Um, but as I say, I don't, uh, I don't. What about a fully settlement? Do you think it's more likely Netflix will just settle this and avoid this whole thing, or do you think maybe the cost of this is almost worth the marketing? I would have said so, because a lot of cases settle, particularly when they are um, high profile, but um, they would... You remind me, Netflix made a comment. Thank you. I almost forgot to put this in. They released a yeah. statement. We intend to defend this matter vigorously and stand by Richard Gadd's right to tell his story. So yeah, how do you take that comment? Yeah, that that to me is is the bit that stands out. Now, if I were looking at this neutrally and objectively, my view on that is... My, my gut feeling is they must have something because why would they say that they're going to so so strongly defend it unless they had something to show that it's true? Unless, of course, they're only planning to say, well, it was his story and therefore we're going to defend it on the basis that it was his story and we were allowing him to tell his story, which is where I I think that they will go with this. I think that they will go with the argument, well, it's his story. He says it's true. We did what we could to determine whether it's true. We did what we could to protect the identity, but it's his story and we're allowing him, we're going to fight for his right to tell that story and our right as Netflix to uh, to broadcast what he says is his story. That's the angle I think they they will go down. But from well, that statement, it it does, it makes it sound like they have something with enough mm -hmm. veracity to, to back up their, their claims. So I think it'll be very interesting. Yeah, and the other thing that's interesting to me is she. there's a lot of things she didn't deny <laughs> that I would hope Netflix will start compiling and playing. So this yeah. is going to fan out and be very interesting, to say the least. So grateful to have you on and coming back. Thank you My for pleasure, making the sir. time again. Black Belt Barrister is the channel, Black Belt Secrets. Go ahead over there. He has awesome breakdowns, guys. Make sure you've subscribed over there. In fact, hit the bell on both channels here and there. Subscribe at the bell. Become part of our notification squads. When you get those notifications, go over there and smash that like immediate. Click a comment and leave your thoughts down below. What do you think about this case? Does she have a shot? Does it infuriate you that she can make the money? Or does she deserve a little bit given that this story wouldn't have happened and they're making a fortune off of it? It's an odd thing. We're going to talk about it more and I may be on Pierce again next week to discuss. So stay tuned. Don't miss out. Thank you guys so much for watching. We'll be back with more here soon on Popcorn Planet.